Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of the Bench Mob ENT Podcast, the best sports podcast in New Jersey. As you see on the screen, and for those that are listening, we have a special guest on for tonight, none other than Griffin Proc, aka GP, aka Griff, the host of Show About Sports with Griffin Proc, talking everything NBA, NFL, MLB, sports period. One of the best threads accounts that you will follow out of anybody because he's giving you all. If you like analytics, if you like stats, if you like somebody that's a student of the sport, this is the man to follow every dang near every hour. It's like four posts where he's dropping information on multiple sports. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. <laughs> that that intro was too much. I really appreciate all the support for yourself everybody on threads couldn't do it without anybody uh, everybody on threads there it's just been an amazing you know cultural culture and everybody that's part of that it's just a social media that's a little bit different than the others so really appreciate it i love you know sharing stuff about sports i'm just your average 20 something guy that's what i have that's my kind of my punchline. and so i appreciate that man i'm happy to be here hey appreciate you hopping on like i said one of my favorite follows on social media in general but definitely on threads i'm like that's the type, like, if you ever met him, I think he would be able to be on JJ Reddick's podcast <laughs> because that's the type of information that you give, which I think is dope. And I like that. Of course, you got the hot takes and stuff like that. That's needed. Yeah. And we know how it works in the podcast world. That's needed. <laughs> but I like the I like to have the stats and the other knowledge that most people just overlook. So I appreciate exactly. what you post. I appreciate that, man. I love JJ Reddick. I love all of those sports shows. I've just been growing up watching all of that. And so that's where I get it all from. I mean, I'll throw a hot take out there, but it's not going to be that hot because I will have a reason for it. It's not, I don't want to exactly. just get clicks. I want to be the uh, level set, you know? Yeah. If it so. is maybe considered a hot take, but you got this to back it up, you got that to back it up. So it's not really a hot take. It may be something that people don't agree with. But when I give you the stats and everything behind it, it's not like just some random stuff where you see some people that get paid to do this that'll say some weird <laughs> stuff just to say it. And then when you ask them to explain it, they have no answers to that. So I appreciate what you do. Yeah. Starting off, you know, the, the NFL Combine just ended. A lot of people had some good showings. Some didn't have any good showings, but that's every Combine. Looking into it because what I like to do, as I mentioned before we started the show, I have a newborn. Well, not a newborn. He's a year old. I have another one on the way. I haven't been able to get a chance to dive into my draft studies and what we should be looking forward to. But I see that you already are on it, of course, with the college football, with the combine, with the draft coming up. Who do you see, especially after this combine, are some of the players that you think offensively and defensively that will be drafted first and have like an immediate impact? coming up this season totally yeah it's a great call out i'm obviously on the tapes already my wife you know she listens to me watching i got youtube pulled up on the tv so she might get a little tired of it I just know that she'll have a good perspective as well but essentially when we're talking offense my number one this isn't even a hot take i love that we talked about hot takes but this is not a hot take marvin harrison jr coming out he didn't do anything in the combine and he shouldn't have Everybody's knocking him for not performing or like playing an equal playing field, but that this is business. He is doing the right thing when it comes to the draft combine by not competing because he's one of those prospects. That's the Jamar Chase, the Justin Jefferson. He could be as good as Jerry Rice and or even his his father. So he's going to be explosive at the next level, and I'm projecting him to go to the Cardinals right here at four or three, uh, depending on which spot they end up at. And so just think about Kyler Murray throwing the ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. Kind of his first receiver that's like generational in that aspect. So I'm expecting huge things from that. And I, I wanted to kick it off with that so that people weren't like just mad that I skipped over kind of those like sure things. He is a sure thing at the end of the day. I don't know your opinions on it, but how do you feel about Marvin Harrison? Uh, I love Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, it was a situation just like with uh, my man that didn't do anything either at the quarterback position. Um, yeah, Caleb. Caleb or Moore. And Jaden Daniels and Drake May, they all didn't do anything. Some people don't have to. Y'all seen the tape. We don't have to go into this. We don't have to do all the. It's the it's the underwear Olympics. I don't feel like getting in my underwear <laughs> and performing for y'all. Y'all seen what I've done. Certain players now. Some players, yes, go to the combine 
It could help your stock. You could run a four two one, and then everybody's looking like, hmm, should I should I be yeah. looking at him a little bit differently? Yeah. So mm-hmm. for some, yes, but for mm-hmm. players like that, where we know it's a, it's not many sure things that you can say in the draft. Mm-hmm. Caleb exactly. Williams. Marvin Harrison Jr. Your things. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's that with this kind of draft when you're up top with the wide receivers, there's not always the sure things, not every single year, but he's one of those guys that if there was no QBs, I would take him number one overall. It's kind of like that situation with Marvin Harrison. And so instant impact when you talk about that. More instant impact, guys. It's it's a deep class for the O-linemen. A lot of people are super hyped on the offensive tackle side of the ball, and I am um, not side of the ball, but offensive tackles. I really like, I got to make sure I say his name right, the Oregon State right tackle, Tilicia Fugaga. I might have said that wrong, and I apologize to him and his family, but he is the best right tackle in this draft. Everybody's talking left tackle, and sure, you can sure up that thing. That's the most important side of the ball, side of the you know line there. But the right tackle is just as important. I'm looking at the Bengals, middle of the middle of the first round. A team like that that needs to protect they their need. assets. <laughs> exactly, and so he, I think, can also get moved inside to a guard position. So he's super versatile. A lot of people are comparing him to Penny Sewell, and I think that's a great comparison across the board because. If you can only if you can kind of touch that Penesul kind of tier, that's a good prospect right there. So I'm excited for him. And I think he's gonna not be one of the first three offensive tackles off the board, but he could be the most impactful right away. Hey, you mentioned Penesul. The Joe Burrow knows that name very well and would <laughs> love to have Pene and the person that you just mentioned, because I don't want to say his name wrong either. Yep. I I read that one. I'm gonna wait till draft day and they <laughs> pronounce it and i get the right pronunciation or have to look it up online but definitely the Bengals, since he's been in the league every single year part of that is him because he holds the ball because he's trying to make a big play but every single year he's top three and sacked mm-hmm. most sacked quarterbacks mm-hmm. please protect that man yeah <laughs> please protect joe that's what I'm saying. That he's getting hurt in the offseason. I mean, he pulled his calf to start this past year, getting chased down by his own teammates like that. Oh, man, you hate to see it. So sure, up both sides of the ball. I know left tackle is super important, but they already got that shirt up. So get to the right side of the ball. I can totally see that happening. And if I'm the Bengals, I'm super excited about this kid. So that's there. And then last but not least, another offensive guy, Jatavian Sanders out of Texas, tight end. Mm. You might not have been hearing a lot about him because tight ends in this draft are not as high as last year. Last year's draft had four or five guys that were borderline first round, second round. They're only talking about Brock Bowers, and they should. He's a really good tight end prospect, and I would take him before Jatavian Sanders. But in today's NFL, I'm taking Jatavian Sanders immediately because he's one of those, and I hate to compare him to great people like this, but the Travis Kelsey's, the Mark Andrews, the George Kittles, where they're going to catch the ball. This is not just for blocking's sake. He is an instant impact, can catch one-handed balls. He's not the fastest guy, but he's always open. Travis Kelsey isn't the fastest guy. That's why I compare it to him where I'm just like, this man's tape is insane with Texas. And so Jatavian Sanders, look for day two, round two or three, but just know that name, instant impact kind of player. Hey, for those that do not know, you got to go check out his page because he definitely called it out with uh, Milton, the Milton, the third mm-hmm. Griffin was he was on that mm-hmm. week, week, weeks ago. He <laughs> was on that. So if he's telling you about these players, please believe this man. He is yeah. on it. He has been watching his film. And I think that's a great comparison with Travis Kelsey. And we talked about it a little bit before on one of my other shows is like the 40 yard dash. Yes, is, is good. It is cute. It's fun to have. But when you mention actually translating that to the field on game day, on Sundays, Mondays, or Thursday nights, Jerry Rice didn't run the fastest 40 time, and he's considered the greatest wide receiver ever. Whoever exactly. wants to make – you can make your argument for him, Randy, or whoever, but Jerry Rice is in that conversation, and he didn't have the fastest 40 time at all. So – do with that what you want, but yeah, hey, Travis Kelsey considered one of the top tight ends ever. Not the fastest guy, but can he get open and catch the ball? Yeah, exactly. No, and that's what you have to do with this kind of tight end nowadays. It's not as much about blocking; it's about being versatile. And he is so versatile, and he's not even projected 
as a first round grade. So you're going to get such value for him for such a good team. I'm thinking personally, big Seahawks fan. I would love to have him on our team. We do. We tight end has kind of been a circle, a circus act. We've had Noah Fant. He's been all right. Will Disley has been all right. Nobody that's really off the page. I'd love to bring this guy in, just open the field more for a guy like Geno Smith and beyond. So excited about him. I think that's a perfect transition to ask too. I mean, we could talk on if you see anybody defensively that makes an impact, but since you brought up Seattle, if you put on the GM hat, what are you guys like? You're the GM of Seattle. What needs to be done draft and free agency to have y'all back in the position of prominence of a playoff team, possibly contending for a championship? Hundred percent. It's a great question, and as, as many Seahawks fans like myself, we don't know what the future holds. It is a fresh slate, new coaching everywhere. Players remain the same. The first thing I do is re-sign Leonard Williams. We brought him in. We need the trenches, both sides of the ball. Re-sign him right away. But it's hard to project what the Seahawks should do based on what is Mike McDonald going to do? What is Ryan Grubb going to do? What are we going to do offensive and defensively? Because Pete Carroll was ground and pound defense and mm. also just like a lot of running. But Ryan Grubb got Michael Penix air raid offense at UW. And so I maybe we're going to let Gino, you know, cook a little bit, like let Russ cook when that was a movement. I'm up for anything that we want to do, but it starts in the trenches. So I want Leonard Williams re-signed. First round draft pick, I want either the kid, I got my notes on it, Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon, the center. Think Tyler Lindenbaum for the Ravens. He's mm. about to be there for 10, 15 years, and he's not going to get enough credit. He's going to turn into you know Jason Kelsey, and everyone's going to be like, dang, when the Ravens did that, that was awesome. That's what centers are. Draft them. He, and it's going to be great value at 16, personally. If we're not going to go that route, get the best guy available. And I think that's going to be a Dallas Turner, a Jared Versailles. Both of those guys on the defensive side can go get the ball. And that's what's important in today's NFL. We have a hard time getting pressure on the ball. And those guys can line up interior, exterior, especially if we have Leonard Williams. We won't have to necessarily draft one that high like a Byron Murphy. So go get a Dallas Turner that's kind of a gadget guy and can, can kind, of, kind of go off a of new Osu on the opposite side, depending on what we do in the offseason uh, with some of our guys. And then draft a QB late. And I know everybody on threads, like you were saying, has probably seen this. And I know I'm a little too hyped on this guy, but Joe Milton out of Tennessee, I understand throwing it 70 yards <laughs> is not important, but this man is Anthony Richardson. He's Anthony yeah. Richardson and everybody was skeptical on Anthony Richardson. And I think that's what he can become. And so I understand football is a lot about touch, touch. Don't throw it so hard. I know you have a missile but you can learn that. So take a flyer on him in the fourth or fifth round and go from there. I don't know. That's my two cents right off the bat. How, how about you? <laughs> I mean, I think that would be great because what we saw with Anthony Richardson last year was flashes of like, oh, we didn't expect this this early, but okay, we see something. He got injured. Mm -hmm. I think it's even a better situation for the Seahawks because for the foreseeable future, you know, knock on wood, Gino doesn't really get injured as much as often. He had a couple injuries last year, but you could have a position where you could actually have Milton not have to start like Indiana. He doesn't have to start right off the bat. He could probably actually sit down a whole year, work on that touch, work on the different things, the mechanics or whatever that needs to be changed. But an arm like that, like you said, why not take a flyer? Gino's not going to be here forever. He's not a spring chicken. So, if we could have the option, like, you know, most teams don't have that lined up. Like, all right, when our quarterback star is getting older and is on his way out, then they're starting to figure out, all right, who's going to have, who's going to replace him. Now nah, we got a replacement. Milton going to wait right here. Mm -hmm. Gino, you got this year. We're going to find out what this new offense is going to be, how we're going to run it. And then we'll see what happens next year. We'll see how much Milton improves this year in the system exactly and i don't want to be in a position where we're at 16 and we're reaching on a bo nix uh you know a Penix, a mccarthy or even reaching in the third rounds for a spencer radler or a michael pratt because i'm not sold on the second tier guys so let's take the highest upside second tier of guys and i think joe milton can be that so think like a hybrid anthony richardson josh allen kind of just 
he lets it fly. He's still learning that I know a lot of people are like, well, he transferred from Michigan. He had to get out. It's everybody's doing that. We can't say he transferred. That's why you saw hardball. Wasn't going to build around a system like that, but in the NFL, that kind of prototype works. And so I'm really interested to see with Milton. So as a Seahawks fan, uh, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be too mad if I saw fourth round Milton on the board there, even though we have Gino who's locked in right now. I don't blame you on that. And that was, people just got to understand and actually pay attention and watch football. That's not what Joe Michigan is not. You saw what happened with JJ McCarthy. That That's not, if you want to be a quarterback, a passing quarterback, get more than 15 attempts a game. Michigan was not the place for you to stay at. So that was a smart move by him. When we look at the draft coming up on the defensive side, who are some prospects that come to mind that, Hey, this year they can make an impact already. Oh, totally. So there's a lot of cornerbacks in this year's draft. And we've been seeing year after year cornerbacks going in the first 10 picks. I expect this to be a super offensive draft, especially at mm-hmm. the beginning, 32 picks. I wouldn't be surprised if like 70% are offense. Like as crazy as that sounds, there's not that Will Anderson. There's not that Aiden Hutchinson of this draft. But when you're looking or like Sauce Gardner or Devin Witherspoon, but the guy closest to Devin Witherspoon, and I personally know that because I watched Devin Witherspoon all year, being a Seahawks fan, is the Quinion Mitchell kid out of Toledo. Mm-hmm. Biggest knock on him. He played at Toledo. So I don't even know half the teams that he was playing against. Wasn't the top tier competition. You might be like, I want to go get one of those Alabama kids. But he has all of the aspects. He's the strongest cornerback of the draft. He's the fastest cornerback of the draft. And he has that twitchiness, that aggressiveness, the punch through the ball. He's not afraid of any side. He's not too small, not too big, not like a Nate Wiggins too like lean. He's a little bit thicker. And so if you're looking for a guy that's going to fall because someone's going to fall in love with the idea of a Clemson or an Alabama cornerback, you could get Quinion Mitchell later. But I think the NFL is going to sure up, like get a little smart and actually draft yeah. him first or second. But if he falls, watch out for him as I think he'll be instant impact on a pretty good team. That would be dope for him too. Like, I I never obviously been drafted in the NFL, but if I was in a position and I get to go to a winning team and I'm able to make an impact from day one, I take that any day of instead of going to Chicago and have to rebuild. And no disrespect to any Bears fans that's watching, but y'all know y'all in a bad situation. Caleb Williams could come; it's not going to turn around immediately. I could be wrong. Caleb Williams could be Patrick Mahomes and everything changes from day one, but I just don't, I don't see it. I, quarterback is needed, but it's a lot of other holes going on in Chicago. Coaching staff, Ryan Poles uh, is. Yeah. Yeah. We, no, it's yeah. not just a Caleb Williams thing. They need to build around him, just like they didn't build around fields. Really. They're like, we got you DJ Moore, but your offensive line sucks. Our coaching staff honestly wasn't too much to write home about. So it's a lot more offensive line. Uh, so many things. So if Caleb doesn't turn out, can't you can't knock him for that. But I think he has a higher upside you know than Justin Fields. You know what's going to happen, too. If it, that first year, two years, it doesn't pan out to that he looks like Patrick Mahomes, even though he doesn't have a line and he only has DJ Moore, mm-hmm. you know that conversation is going to start. Not saying that it's the same situation in Carolina, but that whole conversation has started already. With Bryce, is he a bust? And it didn't help. CJ Stroud had the best possible year that you could have as the number two overall pick. And the conversations have started like, oh, is Bryce a bust? I promise can we you. look at the whole picture? Like, oh, yeah. I don't know if we can say he's a bust as of yet. And it all comes down to this. You have a quarterback on a rookie deal. It's financially the smart thing for a team to do because the quarterback is then the most expensive position after four or five years. So the Bears just restarting with a potentially better quarterback in Caleb Williams than Justin Fields is financially the right thing to do. That's what it should basically come down to. Nothing else. That's all. That's in my opinion. And so I'm interested to see. But that... That's here nor there. That's the Bears. That's their own problem. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other day. That's a whole another episode where if we talk about the scope of the NFL, but yeah, we're not going to spend too much time on, on the Bears. Yeah. But as I stated earlier, college football, college basketball, men's, women's, NBA, NFL, you cover it all on the NBA side, right? 
Celtics looking like the proverbial number one team in the NBA has the best record and the Denver Nuggets after all-star they seem ready hey let's turn this championship DNA back on y'all can't mess with us I'll start on the east who do you see as like the biggest threat possibly to the Boston Celtics so it's a really great question I think the east is the Celtics for the taking I am just if I'm on the west I am jealous I wish I was on the East because the East is battered. Everybody's injured. The teams that are supposed to be good are still developing. And the Celtics, this is going to get you know played on a loop, and it has been for them for a year. It's the, oh, this team's looking different than they did last year. And then we say, well, that's what we said about them last year. But I genuinely think that. And it's crazy. I'm going to say this, and then it's just going to bite us all in the ass. you know. But think about it. I think bringing in Drew Holiday, that veteran presence, is so important. I think the Bucks are missing him more than we are talking about. I think Dame is great, but Drew is just such a calming presence for any team that he was a huge addition for them. So when I go to the team that I think is the most dangerous to them, I think the Bucks are. And I mm. only think it's the Bucks. But if I had to choose another team, it'd be the healthy Knicks. Not the Knicks right now. Not the Knicks that just beat the Cavaliers, because that's a whole different conversation for the Cavaliers. And I'm sorry, it wasn't an agenda last night when I posted that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the healthy, I want to see all of those guys go toe to toe with the Boston Celtics, as I, I genuinely think they could put up a fight. So those two teams, Knicks and Bucks. What about you? Yeah, the Knicks. It's just it's the worst time impossible. Like you said, the injuries. Like I was high on the Knicks leading into it before the Randall injury, and honestly, I've separated my shoulder myself. I'm not Julius Randall. But that's not a that's not a just you just come back. I mean, we've seen even with Kobe. Kobe eventually had to get surgery. Like you could probably play through it, but you're you might see in the playoffs a couple of times Julius Randle going to the side, axing him, hey, pop it back in, pop it back in. So it's still going, it's going to be a problem. One of his issues that we always see come playoff time, shot selection, turnovers. If you got a separated shoulder and you're trying to shoot the rock, that might cause issues. Being that they aren't healthy, like you said, I think the Bucks are the best possible option, and they seem like they've kind of figured something out since All Star break. I still don't trust them though in a seven game series, especially. I know this has been played out, and I know Freak Tom gets upset when I mention it, but Doc Rivers, I if <laughs> maybe maybe he'll be able to out coach Joe Mazzula, maybe. And that'll be his his way to get to the championship is he'll have more experience than Joe Mazzula. But like you said, Drew Holiday, I think it was a better fit. Dame is a sexier fit, but yeah, sometimes you don't have to go with the sexier on the outside. You don't go with that all the time just because they look good and they Instagram model you. you What's on the inside? What what really matters? Exactly. Defense. And Dame doesn't have that right now, really. So Drew and was a better fit. That was that was it. your wife. That was the perfect one. That's what I've been saying when that happened. And I should say it more, but I don't want to tire out, you know, Bucks and Celtics fans. But Derek White and Drew Holiday are the least sexiest picks for a team, but I want them on every single championship roster that I have. Every night. Every single night, because they give you off the bench, they give you starters, they'll hit a big shot. Like, I am not afraid if Derek White takes a game winner. I'll be like, that probably that play was for him. But with the Bucks, I'm like, okay, Brooke Lopez is shooting threes. Like, stop it. And Ante Takumpo, let's uh stop shooting threes yourself. Like, get to the basket. Just do what you do right and let Dame shoot the threes. But if that's your only option, I think Malik Beasley has been great for them. But I I'm taking the other two over Beasley. So, hey, I'm a Lakers fan. I'm telling Bucks fans, don't believe it. Malik mm-hmm. Beasley, when you need him the most, he's going I'm telling I'm a Lakers fan. I saw it in LA. We I saw the flashes in a couple of games. He's shooting 60% from 3. I believe it when they need it game 4, game 5, close out game and he goes 0 for 6. I'm gonna just find this clip and then I'll post it and be like I I told y'all. And to your point, you mentioned Drew Holiday, Derek White. 
that's what the Knicks have too. Like Josh Hart, the other night, 10, 19, and 12. When Jalen Brunson got injured, and give me Josh Hart. Give me Josh Hart on any team every single day of the week. 19 rebounds from your two guard when your point guard, your MVP candidate Brunson gets injured. He steps up. You don't have Randall. And like you said, that's a whole because, you know, the whole agenda and whatnot. That's a whole nother. I don't know what's, what it is with the Cavs. And you you made a post about it when it was on a winning streak. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's not getting a lot of talk in the, the major mainstream media. But I don't know what it is with the Cavs. It's, it's very concerning they're, to lose a game like that. They're just like the Kings of last year. That's what my post was all about. And that's what I talked about on my podcast. The Kings were really good at offense. And then they ran into, you know, the Warriors in the playoffs. And we saw what happens. The Cavs are really good at defense. Not as much on offense as we saw last night, where without Mitchell, they don't have anybody that can produce anything. And I love Mitchell in a uh, playoff atmosphere, but do I love him more than Jalen Brunson and his supporting cast? No, I don't really trust Garland. Mobley has been now overrated uh, at this point. And so, but what's so funny is if the Bucks and the Celtics go against each other, I know you talked about that clip where if Malik Beasley has a bad game, if Jason Tatum has a bad game and the Bucks beat him, you know, that's going to get reversed. Be like, well, I thought Tatum was a top 10 guy. I thought he was a top five guy. So it can go every way, you know? And so it's, I really only think it's between the Bucks and the Celtics. I don't think Embiid's going to come back in time to be healthy enough. The Knicks are too battered, but if they're, if they're right, I think they give them the best chance other than the Bucks. So that's my East predictions. Yeah. Cause um, like you said, Embiid, if I'm Philly, send him out. There's no need. By the time he gets, actually gets back, you're talking about he's not going to be in game shape. So then he got to play himself in the game shape. And then you got the biggest stage playoffs. Nah, protect you again. Joe Burrow conversation, protect your asset. This was a good chance for y'all to win this year, but he got injured. So let's move on to next year. It is what it is on the Western conference. I'm a Lakers fan. As I mentioned, the Denver nuggets, the Denver nuggets, Nicola, freaking yoke it Aaron Gore and Jamal Murray no matter how up and down he plays for some reason he sees the Lakers and it's like a bull seeing red he plays his best games who's the biggest threat to Denver I I, I know I it's not the Lakers I <laughs> see I didn't I didn't want to ran your parade I'm not on the Warriors bandwagon about them coming back either I think they're both in a weird spot when it comes to a team that can beat Denver I think we have to go older rather than younger. And so I like the Clippers and I like the Suns. Now, both teams have been overrated in their own right and then been stopped these past two years. So they haven't proved that they can take that step. But if we look at the Clippers right now, genuinely, I think they match up one through five the best out of anyone and have the star power to keep the game going. With the Suns, I mean, you can't write off KD can't write off Booker in a playoff scenario, even though a lot of people have been throwing a lot of shade at KD, rightfully so, that he hasn't won outside of Golden State. He didn't, he joined the 96 Bulls and won a title. So, like, that's a, a couple times, whatever it was. But, you know, that, so I think the Suns or the Clippers are the best because they're old, older. I shouldn't say old, but older. But if I had to go young, the Timberwolves and the Thunder could give them a good scare. I mean, the Thunder held. Held off the Suns last night. I was worried when they came back. I turned the game off when I was like, oh, Thunder's up by, you know, 25, 26. Turned it back on in the fourth quarter when it was a three-point game. I was like, what is going on? And so, yeah, those would be my teams. I know that was a lot of teams, but. Nah, that's good good, because that's my concern, too, with with the Thunder is just how young they are and how the whole roster really doesn't have any playoff experience. I know they got Gordon Hayward over there, but. If we be honest, Gordon Hayward has been injured probably the last 15 years of his career. So I don't know how much of an impact he's having on the court. Maybe it'll have some veteran experience like, hey, this is what you guys should look for. But at the same time, I've heard it plenty of times, and I know you've heard it too. The veterans that they respect the most are the ones that are still playing and can show them that way, unless you're a UD. And that's not Gordon Hayward's personality to be Udonis Haslam. So I don't think anybody's going to listen in that regard. The Timberwolves, because of their defense, 
And we saw it last year. They gave them, they was the only team that gave Denver somewhat of an issue. But outside of that, Denver just ran through the West like it was no problem. Like, oh, you guys, uh, for all oh, you guys, for it. It was, it was nothing to them. So I think, like you said, Minnesota, or I would say the Clippers, Phoenix is just like, uh, they can't get healthy this year. One game you have KD, one game you have D book, one game you have both of them. And then Bill is at home with his wife. We we just we haven't really seen it. That's my only concern with them. Yeah. Do they have enough time put in to then be able to go into a playoff series and beat this Denver squad where it's literally like clockwork with them? Go ahead. We'll give you a head start. Be up 20. Be up 25. Be up 15 in the fourth with five minutes left. It's okay. We're good. We have Nikola Jokic. We have Jamal Murray. Michael Porter Jr. is shooting lights out. Our bench is solid. We're not worried. And it's given, it's really given that that championship vibe of those championship teams that go on one championship, two championships. They li- they're playing just like that. It doesn't matter what the score is. They never seem like, all right, concerned they're going to lose the game. 100%. And that that's scary. I know the Celtics have it easier in the East, but I don't know if who's beating Denver in a seven-game series. And as much as I didn't want to see it because Nikola Yoka isn't the most athletic person in the world, but I don't know. I can't. I don't know over the next four or five years, unless he wants to go retire and go chill with his horses, they're going to be in that conversation every year. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's without doubt. And I like your Timberwolves call out because you need size against the Nuggets. It's not just Jokic. Everybody on that team is big. I mean, Jamal Murray is a shooting guard at the point guard position. So Ant would be a great matchup for him. And then the two, the Twin Towers, even though, you know, Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert, you can say what you will about them. That's better than having Chet Holmgren and the power forward Jalen Williams against. I saw Nurkic kind of bullying, you know, Chet Holmgren last night. And I like Chet, but Jokic is just going to unintentionally move him out of the way. And so that's what I worry about. It can't be all on, you know, Shea Gildish Alexander's back when it comes to that exactly. team. And it kind of felt that way last night. And I like that in a one game matchup, but in seven games, I need my other exactly. players to show up and be able to, you know, hold their own. Like Denver, like you said. Yeah, I, I like that if y'all in the play in. I like that if it's a let's say a first round, it was back in the eighties and the nineties where it's a best out of five. Okay, cool. I'll take that. But seven game series where you have no answers for Nikola Jokic, who at any point could say, I'm gonna be selfish tonight. I'm gonna go get fifty and still have fifteen rebounds, twelve assists, and a couple of blocks. I, it's crazy. I I weirdly was thinking about this beforehand, and I was like, "How do I even compare this to somebody that says like watches football?" I really like this. Is I think they're the Chiefs. Like they're Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes makes things look easy out there, and that's what Jokic. They like play in slow motion, where you're like, "Oh, Mahomes is just like jogging around," and then he just like makes a crazy pl- pass. Travis Kelsey is like Jamal Murray, always reliable, always there, always open, can carry you for a stretch. And then the rest of them, you're like, Michael Porter Jr., do I like him? Rashid Rice, do I like him? You know, like, Ooh. Pachenko, do yes. I like him? Oh, but I like, you know, C- KCP, I like him because he's he plays hard. And so it's, it's kind of that comparison where the whole year, do we want to find somebody else? Or like, yes. somebody else that's going to win. But then the Chiefs go nine and seven for a while, and then they come back and win the Super Bowl because we all were like, "Oh, that's right, we're dumb as hell." Why did we think that? Like, yes, I don't we've know. Been, you've seen it on all the shows. We're trying to find anybody, and I've <laughs> just been, I've been doing it too on every podcast we have on the regular shows. If I don't have a guest, I'm like, "Oh yeah, we see a we see a four game winning streak from from the Suns. Oh, the Suns look good. Oh, the Clippers. Oh my gosh, Russ and Harden." I just came to accept it over the last two weeks. Like it's Denver. Ew. I don't care if they have the third seed, fourth seed. I still think I think they're gonna get the first seed. It's yeah. Denver's. It's the Nuggets to lose. Um, I can't fight it anymore. It, it is what it is. Like Denver Nuggets, and they're built beautifully. 
the contracts they have set up, they they're going to be in this conversation. They're, that was the perfect analogy. I think that's the title for the show. The Denver Nuggets are the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> that's the perfect analogy. And I never thought about it that way till you just said it. Kansas City, all last year. Oh, yeah. Is this the year? Oh, the Bills are they're they're surging at the right time. This might be the Bills year, Josh. That's the Clippers. Like, That's, the Clippers. <laughs> That's what it is. The Bills are the Clippers. We're like, oh, you know, it's looking pretty good right now. Sorry for cutting you off, but it just gets me excited. No. You know, it gets me excited in the wrong ways where I'm like, we just have to see it for what it is, man. And that's what the Denver Nuggets are. They're just, they're perfect. <laughs> Gotta see it for what it is. Now we mentioned team surgeon, teams getting ready. March is here, which everybody knows that means March madness. Who are some of the teams that you see are some Cinderella teams, some teams that possibly can make some noise that aren't the top teams, you know, the UNCs of the world? The, who on both sides do you see? USC, Iowa, on the women's side, obviously. Like, who do you see are some other teams that could possibly make some noise that's not on everybody's radar? Totally. So for college basketball this year, specifically more men's than women's good luck making any sense of it. When you take your bracket, have your dog choose a team. Cause that's how crazy it is going to be. You can get viral off of it. Cause you might actually have the right bracket. One year, I think an elephant chose a bracket and he did better yeah. than I did. Like that's this kind of year. Everybody's a Cinderella, everyone. And so shame, like, I have to I have to plug my team here. I'm a Washington State University alumni, and the Cougs haven't been to the tournament since 2008. Now, if you might remember, a guy by the name of Clay Thompson was around during that time, and kind of the most famous Washington State basketball player ever. I'm a recent grad, you know, of Washington State University, and I've been following them. We are not a basketball school; we're a football school, no. kind of. But now we're a basketball school. We are second in the Pac-12, one of the best defenses in the Pac-12. Pac-12 freshman of the year winner, maybe Miles Rice, Isaiah Jones, Isaiah Jones going to the NBA kind of prospect. And I didn't even know about this until we started playing. We're we've been in Arizona, number six in the nation twice, both at home and away. Mm. And we're gonna be ranked like a seven seed. Now we think about like the FAUs in the San Diego States of last year. This is a perfect team for that situation. And I'm trying to be objective about it, but I genuinely am excited for the Cougs because I think they're going to come out, take that first opportunity of being the, in the tournament for a while, be a seven or eight seed, take down one of those weaker two seeds, like you just said, North Carolina, a Marquette, a Tennessee. I'm not sold on any of them. So if we're a seven, we beat a 10, go to play a two, watch out. Washington State Cougs, man. We're, uh, we're, we're not too bad. We're not too bad there. <laughs> On the women's side, does anybody come to mind? Because I know obviously everybody's talking about Iowa, the USC's, of course, South Carolina, the expected teams. Do we see any Cinderella's on there? Because, you know, typically what we see so far on the women's side, you might get an upset that first round, that second round, but the cream of the crop always rises when you talk about the women's side. South Carolina, you know they're going to be in there. Unless you, they're going to be in there like, is there any team on the women's side? I was like, all right, they might be able to make some moves. Oh, yeah. It runs through South Carolina. I don't think they get enough credit. That's not going to be my team, but I just want it to be known. South Carolina is making history like Caitlin Clark's making history, and I don't think they're getting enough attention because they. I wrote about it on threads where they are set the new record for most SEC wins in a row at like 73 in a row and climbing. Like they haven't lost an in-conference game in years. Like it's insane. And so shout out to Don Staley. They're running a hell of a program there. So everything runs through them. So if any of these Cinderella teams want to make any noise, good luck trying to go through South Carolina. But I always love a team that's in a conference that is just, they're just winning a ton. So Fairfield, they're in the MAC conference. Yes. 26 I and saw. one. 26 and one. Now they haven't played anybody of note, but I it's like the Florida Gulf Coast of the world where you're just like, they're undefeated essentially. They haven't played anybody, but in March, it's just one game. You show up for mm -hmm. one game, your whole crowd's going to travel for that game. You play, they're projected to be a 12 seed. So you're going to go against like a five, six seed. So it's not the, t the cream of the crop of women's basketball. So I don't know. Watch out for Fairfield. That's my first one. My second one is UNLV, a little bit more known. 
you know, but still in the Mountain West. They've put up 100 points. Let me make sure I say this right. Three times this year in college mm. basketball. That's crazy. What do we got LeBron out there? I mean, not even Kalen Clark's teams are putting up 100. Like, that is a lot of points. One of the most efficient offenses in all of college basketball, both sides. And so watch out for them. They could be projected as a seven seed, kind of like the Cougs, and uh, could make some noise, at least in the first two rounds, I'd expect. I was looking at that. It's funny you mentioned that because I was looking at it today and I saw, I'm like, I've, I've been hearing about fearful and I saw, I'm like, wait, how many games in a row? 26. Hold up. <laughs> I mean, to win that amount of games, like that, I know some people who might view it as because they didn't play anybody, but that's, you still got to play who's in front of you. So to win that many games, is not for nothing. So that's something that should be factored in for sure. Like whoever they end up playing, that's not a team to take lightly. Like they know how to win. Mm -hmm. And you look at the games that they won. It hasn't all been, oh, they won by 25. It, it's been some games where they had to grind it out and figure it out. So I think that'll be perfect for them. And UNLV, you get in buckets like that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever played it, y'all sleep if y'all want. Do not do it. They'll put up a hundred first round and it'll be all over the news. So for sure. And of course, of course, you gotta give the love and the respect to South Carolina and what Dawn Staley's been doing. Like it's tough because it's in a year that Caitlin Clark breaks all these records. So it's going unnoticed in the you know mainstream media, rightfully so, because what Caitlin Clark has it done is absolutely insane. Like nobody saw that the first year that she came in that they would think she would be breaking the record for points for men's and women's. Something that's been held by Pistol Pete for a while. Pistol Pete ain't been in college for, for a while. You talk about Clay Thompson. Pistol Pete hasn't been in college <laughs> <laughs> for a good minute. Exactly. So that was one of those that people didn't think was going to get broken. Even uh, the guy last year was trying to get an extra game in to break the record. Yeah. So shout out to Caitlin Clark, but South Carolina definitely has to be the favorite, has to be the favorite to win it all. They didn't win it last year, but that again, they was right there to win it. So Dawn Staley, I'm not betting. I'm not consciously betting against Dawn Staley at no by any means at all. So no, I can tell you right now I'm putting South Carolina and Iowa in the championship. I want that. That's what I want for women's basketball. I think that would be just like the LSU Iowa last year, like just insane. And also I just want to see, you know, what Caitlin Clark's got it in the biggest moment, you know, because if she can win a national championship on top of the record she just set, the everything's going to break. The internet's going to break. That's going to be awesome for them. But if also Don Staley wins a championship, just a dynasty at that point with South Carolina, they're just pretty, all five of their players are starters in the WNBA. Like that's how good they are. It's, Easy. it's the dream team. It's the fab five. It's whatever you want to call it. And it's kind of insane. So, but watch out Fairfield 26 and one. Don't run them. Hey. Off. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. We got the overtime segment, a little more fun, a little cap and facts, a little sports trivia that we're going to end off the show with again. Griffin Proc is in the building. We thank you for hopping on with us, taking time out of your schedule. I totally forgot to even mention it before we started because I was just so happy to have him on the show. Hey, if you watch up to this point, hit that subscribe button, share, like, and y'all know what I always say, share it with your uncle, your cousin, your dog, and share it with your baby moms. Even if y'all do not talk anymore, this is great content. She's going to want to see it for sure. Closing <laughs> off with this. <laughs> Little trivia, which of these quarterbacks – have never thrown 500 yards in a game. Peyton Manning, Joe Burrow, Matt Schwab, or Tony Romo? Oh, man. Those names. That's we're everywhere with those four names. I, I like feel like a hole going into each of them. I'm like, Matt Schwab just feels like he's done it because why would, why would he be on this list? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, dude, I'm gonna go with Shab though. I'm gonna I'm gonna go there. I know he was slinging it for a while though, but so funny enough, Matt Shab has thrown 500 yards. 
Joe Burrow has thrown 500 yards. And Tony Romo has done it twice. Wow. Peyton Manny, his career high, it was 471. Wow. I mean, that's craziest sense. thing. I saw that. I was looking at the list. I'm like, wait, Peyton hasn't. Wow. Ben Roethlisberger was up there twice, too. Warren Moon was up there. But I would have thought Peyton had a 500 yard game. Peyton yeah. did not have a 500 yard game. That kind of makes sense. I mean, in his era, like, it's there was more, it was more 60 40 run the ball. Not that Peyton Manning wasn't slinging it, but even in his peak with the Broncos where he won that Super, Super Bowl, he wasn't throwing Anthony Richardson 80 yard bombs, or I should say, I should say Joe Milton bombs now, but he was throwing <laughs> checkdowns to Demarius Thomas across the middle. They're like, Demarius, we can't have you run long anymore. Peyton can't throw it like that. You have to run across, you have to run it through the seam. So, that's a good question, though. I I really thought Shab was going to be on that, but dang, he he let it go with Andre Johnson a few times. It sounds like so. Yeah, yeah, he had he had that one. He had one. So oh, and correct it. My bad. It was four seventy nine, four seventy nine, October fifth, twenty fourteen, Denver against Arizona. Yeah, dang. four touchdowns that game. Thirty one for forty seven, hundred and ten point two quarterback rating. So. Dang. They might have taken him out. Maybe that's what happened. They were like, you're done. Probably was. <laughs> yeah. He was sacked three times that game. So they was like, ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're too old for this guy. Come on. <laughs> we can't have you injured. Which quarterback you think will win a Super Bowl first? Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow. Oof, I gotta go Joe Burrow with this one. But my my heart, I want Lamar Jackson to win it. This man has been so close and so ill-defined for so long that I want him to win it because he's really worked on his game and gotten to this point where he's not mentioned in the top five, but I think he's right there at like 5A or 6 right there. But overall, I think Joe Burrow's game fits the best out of that group and the talent that he'll have around him. The Ravens still haven't, like, we're still acting like Odell Beckham's going to carry them you know, to carry Lamar and Mark Andrews gets hurt and their running game disappears like weird play calling. I don't know, but Joe Burrow, I feel like is the perfect game manager, but also on his feet with kind of that Patrick Mahomes level where he'll make it happen when you need it. And then Josh Allen, he needs to just be consistent, man. That's what it comes down to. I, I want to give it to him, but I think the curse of Buffalo remains and probably will for a while. Yeah. I think Lamar needs some more help. They they tried to fool us saying that, you know, they upgraded the wide receiver room last year, but as we saw, it wasn't upgraded. And unfortunately, those running backs at some point in the season are going to get injured. Yep. Literally for the last two, three years. Injury no matter what. And it was like all three, Gus Edwards, JK mm -hmm. Dobbins. Keaton Mitchell, oh, he looks great. Injury. Done. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in Baltimore. I got to go look at the NFL PA, what they, <laughs> what grade they got with the training staff, but something's going on in Baltimore that y'all running backs keep getting injured Seriously. and putting Lamar in a bad situation. But Seriously. yeah, that's a whole nother, whole nother. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll have you back on at some point, especially when we get For closer sure. to the season. For sure. Ask every guest this. I have to ask because as I mentioned before we started the show, I am a foodie. Um, as you can see, I might confuse you because I don't seem that big, but I eat for four. <laughs> so I love food. So I'm going to ask you, what's your favorite go-to meal? Oh, see, this is a tough question because I don't know if I want the PR backlash <laughs> potential because if I watch Yo Rush at all, just saying anything about talk and I love tacos, so don't come after me, people. Because that was crazy, and I agree with everyone that was like, attacking him. But <laughs> my favorite go-to meal, I got to go spaghetti. I love a classic bolognese. That's like my go-to, a meat sauce spaghetti all day. I will have. I literally had that over the weekend. It's it's money. So that's me. What about you? I eat any and everything. Anything. Anything. Any and everything. Like, it's nothing that I do not eat. Um. I've always joked with my wife, though, like one thing, if I, you know, in jail to give you that one last meal before you go, if I had to oh, have yeah. one last meal, it will probably be something really simple that most people wouldn't think about. I want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on wheat bread with chocolate milk, but with the chocolate syrup where you can put as much chocolate syrup as you want. 
I could eat that every single day of the oh, week yeah. for the rest of my life. That Peanut is butter so jelly with chocolate milk. It's so funny you say that. At my day to day job, I get made fun of for having PB and J's. I'm like, you don't understand. This is the simplest yet most effective lunch, and it tastes good. Like, what you just you you lost the childhood in you? Like, what's going on here? Literally. It's the best food pairing ever. It's like a taco. Like that. That did. They just made that perfectly. They figured that exactly. out. Exactly. It's so it's so underrated. So undervalued. And it's nutritious. You got the peanut butter. You got the exactly. jelly. The wheat it's bread. filling. <laughs> it's filling. You have two or three of those. You go for a couple hours, yeah. and you get a little energy. So, I, peanut butter and jelly, hands I'm down, it. every single day of the week. I knew I liked you, man. I knew I liked you. That that <laughs> yes, solidified sir. it. <laughs> and definitely, I pulled up to Seattle. Definitely, I get some. I love a nice bolognese for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, I eat everything. I was even watching before you we came on a food network show it's this spot that was talking about and I, i'm gonna make sure i don't go to a black hole because i will talk about food forever <laughs> but it was a spot that had a bolognese but it was made they had it was one spot that had it with like elk meat and i'm like oh i will want to try that oh yeah it, that looked it looked so good like it was just the, the regular pasta and all that everything the the actual sauce was the typical italian sauce and all that it took five hours to make, and then they added elk to it. I was like, hmm. Yeah. I wrote it down in my notes. I said, okay, when I get to Texas, I might have to try this out for sure. No, that's so funny. You say that I've had bolognese with buffalo meat in it as well. Just as good. It's like a Brazilian steakhouse at this point. They're just changing the meats of like what's going in it. It's I love bolognese. I got to try the elk version because you'll like the buffalo too. It's it's crazy. So I've had a it, I've had a bison burger and I, I love the I've loved the bison meat. So yeah. definitely you probably would love some buffalo. Yeah, we I get I get out that way. We <laughs> for sure. There might not be no sports. We're gonna try a bunch of restaurant spots out for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. Don't worry. We only kind of got football, but don't worry. The Mariners are bad. Soccer's good, but I don't watch enough soccer to have a point of view on it. So yeah, definitely food. We'll get you seafood, the whole nine yards here in the Pacific Northwest. Most definitely. I got two more to get you out of here. Again, we appreciate you hopping on. Best candidate you think to break LeBron's record? Now, most you know, most don't think it'll be broken, but if we're hypothetically speaking here, who in the NBA now or somebody that you see coming in the draft next year, anything like that, that you think could possibly break LeBron's scoring record? I got to go with Luca, I think. I mean, his cuz I'm going longevity here. We look at the way that Luca plays kind of like Joker, 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 bleh, Joker, you know? He just mm -hmm. like stumbles around. He's not making he's not making any kind of careless movements with his body where he might like get injured. He's not like, flying for dunks and stuff. So I think Luca will could play the longest out of anyone and he's already set like first player to do this at 23 or 24 he's super young and he's he's kind of the james harden of this generation where he's not stat padding but they're not winning so you can call it stat padding at that point and so and i love james harden so that's no knock on james harden but i think luca might be able to put up forty thousand in his career but i don't think anybody's gonna to be honest with you i don't think there is a right answer on that one yeah it was just hypothetically speaking just <laughs> Just to possibly throw it up there on a post and have a conversation, but I don't think as the thing is, LeBron probably could play another two, three years, man. Yeah. Who knows where this is ending at? Like we see 40,000 now. This might end at 45, 46,000. Oh, yeah. And that's being healthy. That's, yeah. I, I, that's consistent. We're not even Every single year, he's still what? He hasn't had a year under 23, 24 points per game in a year. 21 years straight. I think that's a good choice. Luca's the <laughs> Luca puts them puts them up there big time. Yeah. Luca, and that that's the only thing I can come to my mind because he's young. May, maybe if Victor Wimbanyama goes on a crazy stretch, but there's no way. If there's no is. way he stays as healthy as, as we yeah. want him to be. Like, and I love Victor. There, I just there's gonna be an ankle, high ankle sprain. There's gonna be something. It's just 
Le- LeBron has done it because of his longevity. It's not just the years he's played. He's played 82 games a year sometimes for multiple seasons. Like that's insane. So my answer might be Caitlin Clark, to be honest with you, on the WNBA side. She might put up 40,000. Hey, <laughs> no, that's a really good answer. <laughs> she, might. she might do that in the W too. Yeah. Like yeah. she's, I think she's going to revolutionize the game in that way. Like Steph the Curry. WNBA, yes, because the WNBA, because we were talking about that with Sabrina. When Sabrina was coming in, we thought it was going to have that Steph Curry effect. She is more of a traditional point guard. She's trying to get everybody involved. Mm-hmm. Caitlin Clark, she gets assists too, but she can still get eight assists and still drop 40. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it'll be an immediate impact because I'm not going to disrespect the grown women that are in the league right now totally, totally. and are probably taking pride in saying, I can't wait till she gets here. And coaches that are literally like, I can't wait till she gets here because I have a game plan for her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at some point, it's going to click. And she can, she, I, she can grant it. It's not 12 minute quarters. It's 10 minute quarters. And at, little by little, they keep increasing the amount of games. Mm-hmm. 40, 42 games. They might end up giving them 50 games. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if she, and that would be crazy. We'll have to hop back on like 15, 20 years. <laughs> if she does that in less than 82 games, good. <sighs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That would be crazy. Last one before we get you out of here. If you had to give us, because I know you listen to multiple multiple podcasts, we mentioned it earlier, JJ, some of the ones that you listened to growing up. If you had to give right now your favorite five sports podcasts that you're listening to, what would they be? And I remember you made a post about this on threads, but I don't know. It might have changed your five. You might be listening to this right now because it's draft season. Your favorite five. Okay, I love it. Well, number one, BME podcast, if you ever heard of it. Uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> I just started listening to it when July, I think, when Threads came out. Yeah, that's number one. But <laughs> Audible mention. We will put them on. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, number one for real is Ryan Russillo's podcast. I don't know if you listen to him at all with The Ringer. He is great. He covers basketball mostly and football as well. Depending on the season, he's great on The Ringer. Bill Simmons. He's been a long time guy in the sports space, big Boston guy, you know, so if you like Boston, he'll talk a lot about Boston, but he's not as biased as he used to be. He used to be a little more off the record when he was younger, but now he's really honed his craft and great kind of commentary and has great groups like yourself. Like he brings people together and has great conversations. I would then say anything from the athletic. I mean, I really like Mm. what the athletics doing when it comes to, the NBA show or the NFL show, depending on the season. I just, you know, go back and forth between those two. So I definitely shout out the athletic there. I love, I forgot what the name of it was. Cause I watch their YouTube clips all the time, but the one with big was and uh, the other guys on, on the ringer, this might be the NBA ringer show. That might be mm, what it's called, I but so. they're really good. The three guys on there are great. Big was is the best. That's why I shouted him out personally. Um, and he has his own stuff on the side. So definitely him as well. And then last but not least, I really like PFF for talking about statistics and everything. A lot of my information comes from PFF. You know, that's where I read a lot of my articles. They have a lot of great people and statisticians there that, you know, stats are one thing, but they make them really mean something at the end of the day. So definitely shout out to PFF specifically the, you know, podcast right now for all the draft content. So, um, those would be my five. And then honorable mention, BME, maybe show about sports. That's pretty good too. And those would be my top seven. <laughs> Definitely. Those are the top seven right there. <laughs> and like you said, PFF, great for that. The athletic. I love listening to the athletic too because, I mean, the articles too are written totally. where they give, depending on if you find the right author, they give that information. And I love, I love bringing it into the shows and like, hey, did you know that they're shooting this percentage from this and this owner? Like I saw a stat that the athletic shared with um one of the articles was that Jalen Brunson on and ones. Matter of fact, I'm a I'm a I'm a it was a crazy stat. I'm like to your point again of how much yeah. he was needed for that team. And the thirty five percent, thirty five percent of Brunson's fouls that he's fouled on a shot, he actually converts the and one leading the NBA right now. Dang, so he can he can stay in the air. He's just like 
an acrobat. If like he's that. getting fouled on a jump shot, 35% of that time, he's making that shot for an and one. I'm like, you don't he's get got those. That. He's got that 2K badge. You know, you ever play 2K with the acrobat badge? He's a hall of fame on that. They're showing animations that are brand new in that game. And you're like, what? Online? Like, I've never. Uh, yeah, that's Jalen Brunson. Biggest all-star snub, Jalen Brunson. That's how Oh, for sure. He should have <laughs> definitely should have started. But. Y'all know the vibes. If you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. Bench mob, we out. Peace.